I get to teach with my baby this morning. Amen. 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 Praise God. Amen. Also, I, somebody ought to be excited with me. Amen. Amen. And it's just a blessing. It's a blessing anytime we get to get to do this. We don't do this very often, but mm -hmm. it's just a blessing to to be able to share the pulpit with her and mm -hmm. and to do what God's called us to do together. Amen. 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 Praise God. But go ahead and take your Bibles in your hand. And repeat after me. This is my Bible. I believe every word. I am who it says I am. I can have what it says I can have. I can do what it says I can do by hearing its word and applying it by faith. It'll change my life. So I declare right now from this day forward that my life will never ever ever be the same again and neither shall the life of anyone with whom I share this word so I declare I'm going to share this word with someone so that their life may be changed forever in Jesus name amen give God praise as you take your seat Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles with me once again to the book of Matthew, chapter 16. Matthew, chapter 16. Amen. And we welcome our Facebook Live audience that's joining with us today. We're blessed to have you with us today. Amen. Amen. Matthew, chapter 16. Now, if you've been with us, you know, we've been talking about our relationship with God and the fact that he never intended for the church to just be a place that we go. Mm -hmm. Tell your neighbor, your relationship with God, relationship with God was, meant was meant to be personal. I told you, God specifically chose you mm -hmm. and he chose you for a reason. As a matter of fact, Peter tells us that you are a we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. Now, we know that phrase, declare the praises, means to demonstrate the glory. Yes, Lord. And that our assignment is to represent the one who chose us. So that our lives would be a demonstration of his glory. Y'all in Matthew chapter 16? Amen. Well, Pastor Stephanie, read verse 13 and 14 for me. Verse 13, it says, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and some and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Okay. Here we see Jesus asking his disciples, who do men say that I am? In other words, what do people think about me? And the disciples respond by telling him what they've heard about him. Some people say you're Elijah. Others that you're Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And Jesus responds in verse 15 by saying, but who do you say that I am? Now, notice he gives little attention to what people in the street have to say about him. But instead, immediately he shifts his focus to the opinion of those closest to him. And the reason is because it is they who have the ability to define his ministry. Uh, what do you mean, Pastor? See, most people are only concerned with public perception. What others think about them. Their reputation. And don't get me wrong, that's important. That's why we talked about our interactions and our issues. But some of us have become experts at superficial interactions while suppressing our issues. Wow. But can I help somebody this morning? Yes. While you're so concerned about your reputation, you need to be focused on your character. Wow. Because your reputation is only who people think you are. Mm -hmm. Your character is who you really are. And nobody knows who you really are like the people closest to you. Right. And since we have declared that 
February is relationship month. This morning, we want to focus on our intimate relationships. Because we have an assignment to demonstrate his glory. And if we're honest, this is the area that the body of Christ has probably failed in the most. As a matter of fact, raise your hand if you consider yourself a leader. Yeah, okay, okay. Well, go over to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And when you get there, Pastor Stephen, I want you to read verse 1 from the New Living Translation. Mm -hmm. It is a true saying that if someone wants to be an elder, he desires an honorable responsibility. All right. Now I need to ask y'all a question. I need y'all to be honest. Now raise your hand if you've ever read this scripture and thought it was talking to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that's what I thought. See, I, I only got two hands. But when I asked you how many of y'all considered yourselves leaders, almost everybody's hand went up. And see, therein lies the problem. But I'm going to help y'all with that today. See, that word elder in the Greek is translated overseer. It means one in charge or leader. Well, doesn't the Bible tell us that God created us in his image yes. and his likeness mm -hmm. to have dominion? Yes. Tell your neighbor, you were created, you were created to, run things. to run things. See, standing in the pulpit does not make you an overseer. All of us were created to walk in authority as believers. Mm -hmm. Whether in our homes, at school, or on our jobs. Now, does that mean you walk in and start bossing people around? No. no. See, we are in charge of setting the atmosphere in the spirit. Yes. See, we have an assignment in the body of Christ to establish the kingdom of God on the earth. As a matter of fact, Paul tells us we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making his appeal through us. In other words, we are a walking representation of the word of God. And our lives speak for Christ. But the problem is we've always looked at people who stand up here and apply a different standard to those who sit down there. Wow. Am I right about it? Yeah. When the truth is I only spend about two hours a week up here. And it's the other 166 hours that truly makes a difference in the lives of the people I impact. See, it's how I spend those other 166 hours that really affects other people's lives. And guess what? The same applies to you. Amen. So let's look at the qualifications he gives us. In verse 2, he says, for an elder must be a man whose life cannot be spoken against. He must be faithful to his wife. He must exhibit self-control, live wisely, and have a good reputation. He must enjoy having guests in his home, must be able to teach. Now, notice one of the first things he mentions is the intimate relationship he has with his wife. Tell your neighbor, your marriage, your marriage says, a lot says a lot about your ministry. About your ministry. Look at verse 3. He says he must not be a heavy drinker or be violent. He must be gentle, peace-loving, not one who loves money. He must manage his own family well with children who respect and obey him. For if a man cannot manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? Here we see that our children are a direct reflection of our leadership. 
and that our intimate relationships directly impact our ability to do ministry. Verse 6, he says, an elder must not be a new Christian because he might be proud of being chosen so soon and the devil will use the pride to make him fall. Verse 7 says, also people outside the church must speak well of him so that he will not fall into the devil's trap and be disgraced. See, your reputation is important, but your character if your character is not properly developed, it will destroy your reputation. Mm. Okay. See, we got to get a hold of this thing. Well, okay, Pastor, I, I hear what you're saying, but I really don't consider myself a leader. Well, we've all been called to serve. Am I right about it? Amen. Well, in verse 8, he says, in the same way, deacons must be people who are respected and have integrity. That word deacon is translated servant. So in other words, it says the same way the deacons, the same thing applies to leaders as it does to servants. Amen. So if you don't consider yourself a leader, you must consider yourself a servant. Wow. So the same thing that applies to the leaders still applies to the servants. Yes. Amen. See, we have an assignment to demonstrate his glory, and it starts in our intimate relationships. Amen. Go over to Ephesians chapter 5. Are y'all getting anything out of this? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Y'all there? Amen. 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 All right. It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Verse 24. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with word, excuse me, washing with water through the word, and to pre present herself to him as a radiant church without stain, wrinkle, or blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they, fed, they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Here we see that contrary to popular opinion, marriage is not about fulfilling your needs. Okay, so marriage isn't just all about you, amen? And wants. Marriage was designed to symbolize the relationship of Christ and the church. Tell your neighbor the purpose of marriage. The purpose of marriage. Was to bring God glory. Was to bring God glory. Let me help you see this. Let's look at verse number 21. It says submit. Ooh, tell your neighbor submit. Submit. To one another out of reverence. Tell your other neighbor, out of reverence. Out of reverence. For Christ. For Christ. Yes. See, how you treat each other reflects how you feel about Christ. In other words, your relationship with one another is the manifestation of your relationship with God. You know, if you have problems with each other, it indicates that you have problems with the Father. So if y'all got issues at home, then you got issues with God. 
You got problems in your marriage, then you have problems with God. So you have to reevaluate that relationship. First and foremost with God, but then who God put together. Let no man separate. Amen. And we're not talking about a physical man. We're just talking about anything that can try to come in and disrupt a marriage. <clears throat> Glory to God. Turn, look at verse 22. It says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Now, I know to some people, submission is a dirty word. I got to laugh when I tell ladies, girl, you need to submit. Submit? <coughs> you ought to see the looks and stares I get. <laughs> like I cussed at them. <laughs> see, some ladies don't want to hear that because they make their own money. Girl, I take care of me. I got my own stuff. So they don't have to submit to no man. I ain't got to answer to no man. That's not me, baby. I don't. Okay. I, I saw him peeping over at me. I was like, hey, me, but I'm sorry. Like, okay. Anyway. <laughs> I digress. Let me continue. All right. So <laughs> God says, submit yourselves to your own husband as you do to the Lord. So if you have a problem submitting to your husband, maybe the problem is you don't want to submit to the Lord. Mm. Because it wasn't your husband that said submit to him. It was God. Amen. Amen. I'm glad I got a few amens. Lord have mercy. I thought I was going to hear crickets chirping there for a minute. Because if you submit to God and submit to the Lord, you submit to your husband. See, the problem is most people don't know what the word submission really means. Submission equals coming under the mission or to support the mission. So you should support the mission of your husband. Lord, let me say that again, ladies. Mm. You should support the mission of your husband. Amen. He needs you. Amen? Amen? He needs you. So you are to support it, not fight it. Wow. Just like you support the mission of the Lord. Now, why is that? Well, he tells us in verse 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, and Christ is the head of the church, Amen. his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. See, because when you submit to your husband, it shows how we are supposed to submit to Christ. See, your whole relationship is supposed to be an example to the world. Mm. So how are we going to look walking around not submitting to our husbands and sucking our teeth and rolling our eyes behind his back? Mm -hmm. That's not living the example. Amen? You know, we don't do that to Christ, do we? No. no. If we are the example to be reflected of Christ's glory, then guess what? We do the same with our husbands. Glory to God. And it says, Amen. Your whole relationship is supposed to be an example. If a Christian woman, if, excuse me, if you're a Christian woman and you're walking around grumbling and complaining, you know, like I said, sucking the teeth and rolling the eyes, one thing I can't stand is a complaining woman. Yeah, I said it, ladies. <laughs> I can't stand no complaining woman. I can't stand a woman who has a foul mouth. I can't stand a woman that doesn't bring any kind of glory, not only to God, to themselves, or to their husbands. <clears throat> so when you submit to your husband, you should want to have that relationship with Jesus. Amen. Because your relationship with Jesus and your relationship with your husband is to bring God glory. Amen. Amen. Now, if her job is to support his mission, then what is his mission? Well, look at verse 25. Here it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 
Now, wait a minute. If my assignment is to love my wife and to give up my life for her, then she should be willing to do whatever it takes to support my mission. Amen. See, it looks like to me she would want me to have all the help I can get. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. If, if my job is to lay down my life for her, then, 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 then she ought to be trying to buy me a Sealy Posturepedic to lay my life down on. Do you understand what I'm saying? Full price. Yeah, yeah. What, 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 what you need? See, see, that's, see, that's the thing. It, we, we, don't even, we don't even understand that concept. When, when you're walking in rebellion, you don't even realize what you're rebelling against. When you're resisting submission, you don't realize that you're actually hindering yourself. Yes. And that's what we and we don't recognize the fact that what we're actually doing is we're making a mockery of Christ. Mm -hmm. I don't care how many scriptures you can quote. I don't care how long you can pray. I don't care. You can fast until you think you're starving to death. <laughs> you think you're looking spiritual. Right. But it's those intimate relationships. Mm -hmm. See, because we have mastered the art of the hallelujah. Glory. See, we, we didn't we didn't master this look. Yeah, yeah. But oh watch this. How many of y'all done seen TV shows with guys who play gangsters on TV? Yeah. But then you see them at the award shows and they got tuxedos on and, and everything else. Uh -huh. yeah. See, because anybody can play a gangster on TV. Yeah. Mm. Oh, y'all didn't catch that. <laughs> See, anybody can play a Christian at church. Follow me home. See, the question is not who, who you want the pastor to think you are or the folk in church to think you are. The question is, if I were to do a survey of the folk that live in your house, would they agree? See, that's why these intimate relationships are so important if we're going to give God glory. Mm -hmm. We've got to get a hold of this revelation. Well, 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 Pastor, I hear what you're saying, but you don't understand how she is. <laughs> you don't understand what he be doing. No, neither of you understand the purpose of your relationship. Right. It's to bring him glory. As a matter of fact, Paul reminds us that man is the image and the glory of God and woman is the glory of man. See, glory, that word glory means an honorable representation. So in other words, as a man, my life, my behavior, my character should be a honorable representation of who God is. And my wife should be a reflection of who I am. Amen. Now I know some of you may be thinking something you shouldn't. And I'll tell you now, if you are, you better not say it. <laughs> but if you properly honor God and his word, my character becomes a representation of who he is. And when I properly honor my wife and she honors me, she will become a representation of who I am. Now, we know that man is the image and glory of God, and woman is the glory of man. Well, go over to Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs chapter 17. And when you get that, I want you to look at verse 6. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 6. Here it says, children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children is their father. Now, wait a minute, Pastor. This says the father is the glory of children. So, according to what you just said, that means that his life and his behavior and his character should be a representation of who they are. That don't sound right. Well, not exactly. Instead, it means his life, his behavior, his character is a representation of who they will become. 
Oh, you got to catch a hold of that. See, because if you have you ever wondered why little girls normally grow up to marry somebody with traits similar to their fathers? Yeah. Yeah. See, because why little boys grow up and they say, you just like your daddy. See, because his life, his behavior, his character is a representation of who they will become. And that's why these intimate relationships are so critical. Let me help y'all see this. How many of y'all ever heard the term PKs before? Preacher kids. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. PKs. And that's because children are a representation of your character and not your reputation. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, see, because that term PK is not a good thing. Right. We've never said that as a term of endearment. If somebody called your child a PK as a preacher's kid, that was never something positive. Mm -hmm. We use that as a derogatory term because what we really were saying was, I thought your daddy was a preacher. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. And what we're really saying is that your behavior is not indicative of who you are supposed to be. But in all actuality, their, in, their behavior is exactly indicative of who their parents actually are. Mm. <laughs> Difference between D and R. Mm. Because children are a representation of your character and not your reputation. Mm. See, because you know him from the two hours he spends in the pulpit. But they know him from the other 166 at home. Oh, I know I just said something. Well, there's only one thing worse than a PK. And that's a CK. Church folk kids. Amen. Because there are a lot more of them than there are of PKs. Because there are a whole lot more church folk than there are preachers. And see why we quit to go. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah, they, they out there off the chain. They're a PK. <laughs> but when your kid's off the chain, oh, well, you know, pastor, pray for them because they just struggling. No, they're not struggling. They are a representation of your life and your behavior and your character. Because they're not modeling the two hours that you show me during the week. They're modeling them 166 that you show them at home. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know I ain't going to get no whole lot of amen right now. <laughs> but trust me, I bought a few for myself. <laughs> Say amen, Pastor Stephanie. <laughs> Courtney, can I get one? <laughs> Higher, can I get a hundred? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. See, we don't seem to understand that. See, we have an assignment to demonstrate his glory. And we got to recognize the impact of those intimate relationships. Go over to Proverbs 22. See, we don't recognize. We look at how many churches we got in the world right now. How many people in the world right now consider themselves to be saved? And look at the state of the young people in the world right now. What does that say? Look at the state of marriage in the world right now. What does that say? That say we got a whole lot of folk that know how to pretend on Sunday morning. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I said it. I said it. I'm looking at y'all. All of y'all out there in internet land, I'm talking to y'all too. Yo. And that's our problem. And until we get that right, 
Ain't no need of us talking about how dark it is outside. Trust me, you need to change some light bulbs in the house. Well, yeah. Y'all in Proverbs 22? Yeah. Look at verse 6. Here he says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. See, this particular scripture right here changed the course and direction of my entire family. See, I remember when I really gave my life to Christ. When I officially gave my life to Christ, I was 26 years old. Now, I grew up in church like most folk. I was baptized at nine years old. But I got baptized because I was tired of passing the communion tray over my head and I wanted to know what everybody else was eating. <laughs> I'm like, I don't think it's fair. Right. So I wanted to see what was going on. And so I'm like, how come I can't have none? Your mama said, because you ain't baptized. Yeah. So what you got to do to get baptized? <laughs> well, when they had homecoming, you got to go up there and sit up on the front. <laughs> right. Oh, come on now. Don't act like y'all ain't never been to no Baptist church before. <laughs> so I went up there and I sat on the front. And they went out there and took me and put me in that little cement pool, dipped me in some water. I got out the water and next time they had communion, I could have some. <laughs> but won't no giving no life to Christ. Won't no salvation. Didn't understand nothing about none of that. So won't nothing change it. Nothing. Went to Sunday school. Went to church. Got tired of coloring pictures of Jesus. Got tired of sleeping on the pews. They were too hard. So when I was 16, I said, I ain't going no more. Mama won't go argue with me. 16, I was six foot, 200 and a quarter. Ain't going to be no whole lot of arguing with me. And so I hit the street and hit the street hard. Did all I could do. And when I actually gave my life to Christ, and I'm married, and I'm in the word, and me and my wife are talking about having children, I started reflecting on my life. How many times I done almost been dead? How many times I done almost killed people? How many people I done corrupted? How much stuff I done been in? And I'm like, do I want my children going through this? And all I could ever remember people saying, well, oh, don't worry about him. He'll, he, he'll come back. Come back where? I ain't never been nowhere. I said, that ain't the will of God. And when I saw the scripture, I knew it was not the will of God because he said, if you train him up in the way he should go, when he's old, he will not depart. So he said, if I get on the path, I'll never get off. So I said, God, why is this? What is something wrong? Because I just got on this path. I ain't never been on this path before. He said, you did what you were trained to do. I'm like, wait a minute. Don't sound right. Because I was drinking, running women, doing everything I could do. Well, as soon as I was old enough, my daddy would tell me, go to the refrigerator and bring me a beer, boy. So what did I do? I went and got him a beer. That was training. And as soon as I got old enough to go get my own, I went and got my own because I had been trained. I had seen people in my family run women. So as soon as I was old enough, I ran my own. See, everything that you knew how to do wrong, somebody showed you. And it won't in church on Sunday. Right. It was doing them other 166 hours. How many of y'all took a cussing class in school? No. no, you learned that at the house. 
See, it's those intimate relationships that affected you and you became a representation of what you saw. So if we're going to make that difference, we got to start recognizing the value of that intimate relationship. You learn, you watch TV at home. Everything you learn, you learn to train by training. Mm -hmm. See, it wasn't what they told you, it's what they showed you. If you go to work at a fast food restaurant and you never worked there before, they don't tell you just go drop some fries. If you go drop some fries at a fast food restaurant, you go into the emergency room. Do you know how hot that grease is? Yeah. You drop that frozen bag of fries in that hot grease and you go into the hospital. <laughs> so the first time they tell you you got to drop some fries, somebody going to show you how. Yeah. And they're going to make sure the first time you do it, they're standing right there with you to make sure you don't put grease all over the floor and all over yourself and do not set the restaurant on fire. Yeah, that's right. yeah. that's right. So if they're going to train you how to drop fries, you can't even work fries without training. How you think you're going to live for the Lord without training? That's right. Tell your neighbor, you got to set an example in your home. Go over to Psalm 127. Are we going anywhere? See, I'm tired of the excuses people are having about What's wrong with society? What's wrong with these kids? What's wrong? No, these are your kids. This is your family. And if you don't start taking authority and responsibility for what's going on in your household, then it's going to continue to be that way. Psalm 127. And look at verse 3. Here he says, behold, children are a heritage of, from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Tell your neighbor, children are a blessing. Children are a blessing. First of all, you got to start treating them like one. Wow. You got to start realizing how valuable they are. Yep. See, one of the problems is when we have children too early, they, we feel like they're a burden, and so we treat them like a burden. <laughs> sure. That's one of those issues where we got to start taking our time having our families the way that we, we want to have our families. And that way we can sit back and now I don't feel like I got to push them off on grandma to try to raise them. I, I ain't got to be sitting there now, they getting on my nerves and so let me push them off in their room and let them know. Me and my wife, we spend time watching TV with our kids every day because you ain't just watching anything in my house. You ain't just sitting around with no earbuds in your ears all day in my house. See, because we don't realize the stuff that we, we exposing them to. And it ain't no burden for me to sit up in there and watch TV with you. I got a 17 year old, and no, you can't watch anything you want to watch in my house. I don't care if it said why 14. 14 is too crazy these days on television. We don't recognize that. They are a heritage, they are a reward, they are something to treasure. And if we don't treat them like that, they're going to become something you wish you never had. He says, like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. What do you do with arrows? But first you got to aim them. See, you don't just go out and just shooting arrows anywhere. You got to make sure you direct them. And then you got to make sure that you've put enough force behind them when they go that they hit their target. So I got to give them all of what they need to get to where they're supposed to go, but I first got to point them in the right direction. Mm -hmm. See, that requires me giving them the word that they need. Showing them what's right and wrong. Mm -hmm. See, people always tell me, well, you know, you got to let them grow up. Well, guess what? You don't let the shrubs outside your house just grow up. <laughs> you out there every week cutting and pruning. Trim, trimming and shaping because you're concerned with the outcome. You're concerned with the finished product. Well, the old folk used to say you better bend a tree while it's green. Amen? Amen. Go over to Deuteronomy chapter 6. You 
you know, it is so important to, to bring and train up your children. I mean, that's just part of nurturing. You know, when you nurture someone, you got to feed them, you encourage them, you support them, right? So, you know, by bringing and training them, training them up in the instruction of the Lord, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, we've all made mistakes. Don't get me wrong. You know, when Pastor Turker was talking about how, you know, he used to color pictures on the pew until he was too big to color. You know, I went to church every Sunday. But at one point in my life, I was playing church. You know how I talked about last week when people say, how you doing? I'm fine. I put on a face really good. But on the inside, I was tore up. The pits of hell were trying to take me down the slippery slope. And because of my experiences, I made a point that my daughters were not going to go through what I went through. To believe the lies of the enemy, you know, to fall for the okie doke of some good looking fella that comes walking through the door. Okay. Won't under look too good as me. She should have just waited. <laughs> yeah, my, my life changed. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm saying. but <laughs> Y'all heard me say in the past I made mistakes, right? All right? So that was before Christ. In my past, I made mistakes. All right? When I met him, things changed. Oh, anyway. So <laughs> he messed up my illustration. So <laughs> as I was saying, <laughs> you know, I want my girls not to make those same mistakes. That's why I talk candidly, open with my daughters. They know they can talk to me about anything, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm going to nurture them. I'm going to train them and bring them up in the instruction. Amen? Mm -hmm. Are y'all at Deuteronomy 6? Yeah. All right. It says, And these words which I commanded you today shall be in your heart. <clears throat> You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You know, if you look at verse number six, it says, these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Now, the amplified version says in your heart and your mind. All right? Mm -hmm. So, yes, yeah, in your heart, but your mind also has to be prepared. Amen. And then it says, then you shall, again, instruct your children diligently. So you got to get the word in your heart and your mind so that you know what you're talking about. You're not basing it all on feeling. You're basing it on the word of God. Verse 8 says, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Now, again, I love this, the Amplified. It says, you shall wet and sharpen them so as to make them penetrate and teach and impress them diligently upon the minds and hearts of your children. Boy. They're telling you to teach them, to impress them, and to diligently do it. That don't mean halfway doing it. Come on, ladies, y'all know how it is. You tired, and then you have a child that wants to talk to you, and you're listening to them, but you're not listening to them. You got <laughs> you to teach them the word. You got to be able to refresh yourself, be able to get in that word so you can impress it upon your children's lives. Then it says... Sorry. And it says, <clears throat> and you shall bind them as a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets or forehead bands between your eyes. So, you know, when you lie and you rise up and you teach your children the word of God, the word of God should be on them so much because you have diligently spent time with them through that word. When it said it's supposed to be a forehead band, all I could think about was a headband on my child's head that had the word of God right here. Because the enemy is trying to steal our children's minds, their will, and their emotion. He's trying to take their souls. 
And if you're a mother or someone who's like a mother or a grandmother, you do all you can so that your children will not be subjected unto the enemy. Amen. Amen. You know, we get upset because, you know, they took prayer out of, out of school. Not only did they take prayer out of school, they took prayer right out of home. Think about that. You know, when we had our uh, blackout during the fast, we made a point of 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. We shut out the world so we can focus on the work. And our house is always at peace, but it was at total peace. Amen? Amen. So, you know, don't complain about taking prayer out of schools if you're not praying in your home. It's our job as mothers, as parents, to educate our children in the Word. Amen. You know, I, when I was little, I could sing any hymn you wanted to sing, but I didn't know the Word that supported the hymn. Okay? The Word is what's paramount. Fall in love with it again. Amen. Fall in love with it so much that you make an effort to impress it upon those that are in your presence. Amen? Amen. You know, and that's, and that's the thing. When you, we don't even recognize how important that is and how, how big of an influence that we can have on our children when we constantly are feeding them the word on a regular basis. You know, I, I can't tell you how blessed it is. You know, in my house, man, I, I'll, I'll come in, you know, in the middle of the week. Like I said, you know, we have our midweek services on Thursday. And I can go into my kids' room and they're sitting there on their tablets streaming, you know, midweek services, you know, from our our covenant family, you know, in other churches, you know, they're, they're watching somebody else's Bible study. You know, they get they get in the word, you know, and my daughter sends me links to YouTube's of sermons that she's watching online. And I'm like, this 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 is what life is supposed to be. You know, she's like, Dad, check this word out. You know, I'm like, that's that's what relationships are supposed to look like with your children, because we have spent and, and, and put this like I said, they're supposed to be a reflection of my character and my behavior and my life because that's that's what we do this is what this is and, and it becomes that you know when your conversations are centered around the word that's that's what it becomes it becomes literal to them you like I said and, and it is to that point where that's what you want out of your children because mm -hmm. when they're not in your presence you don't have to worry about what they talking about because you know this is their life this is who they are this is their character when they can come back and tell you other people were talking crazy and they can tell you how they responded with the word of god how they've recognized how the, how to apply these things in other situations because this is what god has called us to do because that's how these relationships of ours are supposed to impact and impact the rest of the world the problem is we've neglected these relationships, and now when we go out into the world, our, our witness is ineffective because our relationships inside our homes don't go outside our homes. Yeah. We go out places and people see our marriages and they're looking at how we're getting along and they're like, how are you going to tell me anything about God? And look at how you and your husband getting along. You know, look at how your kids behave. Yeah. And so they're looking at you because watch. Half the time, the people you talking to and you trying to talk to them about church and the word, they got those problems. Mm -hmm. Their marriage is towed up. And that's what they, they, that's what they praying to God about. And you trying to tell them about God, and they were like, well, if your marriage towed up, what's your God going to do for me? That's, 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 that's the God I'm looking for. I'm looking for the God that can fix this. My kids lost their mind. I'm looking for a God that can fix this, and your kids just as crazy as mine. So what God, what, 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 what your church going to do for me? And that's, that's what it is that we have to recognize. Mm -hmm. Go over to Joshua 20, 24. Joshua 24. When you get there, look at verse 15. Here he says, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your, your father served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
See, as a husband and a father, my responsibility is to set the tone in my house, to set the atmosphere in the spirit. See, one of those things I, I recognized long ago, I, I can't sit back and wait for my wife to set the tone in my house because that's not what the Bible tells me. It's my responsibility to do that. And I cannot shirk my responsibility and then try to blame it on anybody else. That's my job. And I'm not going to let anybody else take my job. That's my responsibility. You know, I was telling, I was telling somebody one time before, I said, that's, that's a hard, fast rule I got in my house. Anything that go to sleep in my house on, on Saturday night going to serve my God. I don't care who it is. Yep. There was a period of time when my mother-in-law came to live with us, and, and, and I remember when she came and she stayed there, and I remember the first weekend, that Saturday night we were getting ready to go to bed. I told my wife, I said, go tell your mom what time church is on tomorrow. And she said, well, I'll go see if she want to go. I said, no, that's not what I said. I said, you go tell her what time we leave for church. Because anything to go to sleep in here, go serve, going to serve my God. Yeah. Otherwise, you need to find somewhere else to stay. That's not how that works. That's just the rules. Yeah. We, don't, we don't do house guests. We don't do, and nobody, nobody gets that option. And, and so that's how, that's how that has to be. Because we've got to recognize we've got a responsibility. My children know that. And so that, that, that'll never be the case. They, they'll be sitting there talking, about, I'm tired. I don't feel like, please. I'm sick. You sick? You better not go nowhere. I better not see you go nowhere for two, three days. Because ain't no miraculous healings. You sick for church. And then tomorrow you going, you going anywhere else you want to no, do. I don't play that. We don't, we don't do that. Because God comes first. Go over to Proverbs 31. God definitely comes first. You know, and just to recap a little bit about submission, you know, when, when my husband told me that about, you know, my mom having to go to church and, you know, and I said, well, let me check. And he was like, no, you need to tell her. If I wasn't a submissive wife, I would have never done that. It would have been total discord in our household. And he, at that time, he was pastoring. So, you know, if I disobeyed or was being rebellious, then, you know, I wouldn't have helped him meet the mission that he had set for that day. The last thing y'all want to have as a pastor to teach y'all that got an attitude with his wife and family. Because it will come across the pulpit. I hear it all the time. Y'all there? At uh, Proverbs 31? It says, Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rub rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her so he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. Now let's look down at verse 25. It says, strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom and on her tongue the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. You know, I hear a lot of times women talk about the virtuous woman and, you know, how they're like, oh, she's just totally unrealistic, you know, working and, you know, all they look at is what she can provide to the household monetarily. But this has so much more in this scripture that will help you recognize that as women and being the woman who, who is the glory of her husband, you are capable, you are intelligent, and virtuous, okay? The Bible even talks about how it says he safely trusts her. You want your husband to be able to trust you with responsibilities, amen? You know, confidently can trust. You know, he's got to confidently trust me that I'm able to do what I have to do in order to make sure the girls are okay, you know, make sure I'm there for the ministry, but also to support him. You know, to confidently trust in someone means that you rely on them and that they believe in you. You know, I've seen so, mar so many marriages fail because of that, where, you know, the husband may have been out of place. 
and then the woman feels like she has to take it over. That's totally out of order. Then they can't believe in one another. And if they can't count on each other and believe in one another, the children are going to see that same type of representation where they're not going to feel they can rely, or rely on their parents. And that's when they go out to other influences, like the street or some other people. Verse 12, it talks about how she comforts, encourages, and does him only good as long as there is life within her. You know, life, we just think about living, breathing, and walking, and having a pulse, <laughs> right? Last week, we talked about how out of our heart flows the issues of life. Life is more than just that. You know, life can be how we approach things, how we, you know, deal with things. You know, depression, anxiety, bitterness, anger, discouragement can suck the life out of you. And the goal for the woman is to encourage him and do him only good as long as there's life within her. Now, if you feel like you don't have enough life, then get back in the Word. <laughs> if you feel like you don't have enough life, then come to training. Amen? You need that in order to be able to be that virtuous woman. Again, you're intelligent and you're capable. Tell your sister, don't be stupid. <laughs> All right. So in verse 25, it talks about um, how she rejoices over the future. In other words, the latter day or time to come, knowing that she and her family are ready for it. One of the things about being a virtuous woman, as I mentioned, I, I, I don't like when a woman grumble and complain. You know, our goal as women is to, you know, rejoice over whatever happened in the past. Because it may not have all been pleasant, right? And as long as we train in the word or, or excuse me, nurture our children in the word and support our husband, then we can present the, the present and rejoice in the future because our goal is to make sure that they're capable and ready for it. We know the present and the future is uncertain, but as long as we spend time in the Word and being that virtuous woman, that confident, that intelligent and capable woman who will be able to provide that nurturing for their husbands and their children, then we should rejoice about the present we should rejoice about their future, and we can even rejoice about the past when things were torn from the floor up. Mm -hmm. That's beauty. Rejoice is beauty. Mm -hmm. Grumbling is not. So it talks about in verse 26, giving counsel and instruction. That is the law of kindness. In order to be kind, you got to give some counsel and, and instruction. That's love. I laughed the other night. My daughter said, Mommy, you just love to micromanage me. Mm -hmm. I said, micromanage? I said, you don't know anything about micromanaging. I said, this is guidance and instruction. <laughs> and sometimes you got to remind our children of different things. Because one day, my daughters are going to be wives, they're going to be mothers, they're going to have their own household. And the last thing I want is them not to know what to do. So the law of kindness says, I have to guide and counsel them. Amen. I caught that little side, side look between <laughs> pastor and my youngest. I'll address that later. But anyway, <laughs> but you know, if anything, <laughs> You know, if anything, one of the things with Pastor and I, we complement one another. We don't compete with one another. You know, so many times parents or mothers try to put roles on women. You need to cook, clean, and wash. Do I cook? No. Thank you. What? <laughs> <laughs> am I supposed to be? No, I don't cook. <laughs> But it's true, I don't cook. For those who know me, I don't have to cook. The reason why I don't have to cook is because my husband knows what the family needs. He knows that I'm out of the house the majority of the day, pouring out and taking care of other people, so he cooks, right? 
And <laughs> as a result of complimenting one another, you know, we can teach our children how to rejoice in knowing that, okay, this is my future. And this is what I do to be a good wife, a mother, a career woman, confident and intelligent. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, and then uh, verse 27, it talks about the breed of, um, to bre excuse me, the bread of idleness. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, idleness is gossip, discontent, and self-pity. Okay? So you notice that uh, the idle mind is the devil's workshop. You hear people say that all the time, don't you? We do not want to eat other bread of idleness, ladies. We do not want to be gossipers. We do not want to be discontent. Because as soon as you're discontent, you're going to cause the ship to just sink. Because as Pastor taught one time before, I think you said happiness is not based on happenings. Yep. And to be discontent means that you're not pleased. Amen. And then the final verse where it talks about her children rise up and call her blessed. And bless is being happy, fortunate, and to be envied. You know, I love it when my daughters would go, that's my mama. You know, and they're proud to say, that's my mama. I love to hear when they say, Ma, you know, my friends say that y'all are just so cool. Ma, they say you're so nice. Ma, they say you're so funny. That's great. I want to be that example. Do you understand what I'm saying? The last thing I want them to say, girl, my mama get on my last nerve. I've had friends that are like that, amen? But I want to be one that is happy and fortunate and to be envied. And then it finally says, and her husband boasts and praises her, saying, many daughters have done virtuous, virtuously, nobly, and well with strength of character that is steadfast in goodness. And then it says, but you excel them all. I excel them all, don't I, babe? Yes, ma'am. There we go. Y'all heard that Facebook Live, right? That's my baby. I excel them all. Amen? Amen? So, you know, you're designed, you're created for that specific purpose to be, you know, the virtuous woman, to be the woman that is the glory of her husband, as the husband is the glory of Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Go over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to get ready to close out. This is the last scripture. But I, I really want you to understand it because, like I said, we're talking about our, these intimate relationships. We're talking about, you know, the, the qualifications that, you know, Paul gives Timothy. It talks about for ministry, like I said, whether you're leaders or whether you're serving. You know, just being in the body of Christ as a believer, these same characteristics, these same qualifications apply to us as believers. Mm -hmm. And they affect our ability to complete our assignment of demonstrating God's glory in the earth. And like I said, because we've neglected these, like I told you, it, it has been one of the major hindrances to the body of Christ. These intimate relationships of, of our marriage, of our children, the, the people that are closest to us, because I told you, we go out and we try to show out a face and we try to let other people see who we are. We're more concerned about our reputation, but our character is who we really are. And the people who see us on a regular basis, on a day-to-day -day basis, the people who spend that other 166 hours a week with us, they know who we really are. And it's that reputation that, that we have amongst them. That's the one that's going out into the earth. It's our relationship with them that people are seeing. Because it's the fruit of that relationship with them that everybody actually gets to see. It's not the one that you're trying to show them that they're seeing. And so well, that's what we have to recognize. And so if we realize that and realize that we have an assignment to demonstrate his glory, we have to do what Paul says here in verse 27, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27. He says, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest what I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. And you might say, well, what does that have to do with anything? What he's saying here is he says, I discipline my body, he says, and bring it into subjection. In other words, you have to get to the point where we recognize that I have to put my flesh into subjection. Mm -hmm. I got to stop worrying about what I want, what I feel, you know, my emotions. I got to put all that into subjection. See, because so many times what hinders those relationships in our marriage, in our household, mm -hmm. it's our flesh. 
The Bible even tells us, he says, where did the, where did the quarrels come from among you? He says, you, you, what is, is those selfish desires that you have in your flesh. He says, you won't, but you can't have your way. He says, so you, you, you fight and you and, and all of that stuff that happens in those relationships, whether it's amongst your wife, in, in your spouses or, or amongst your children. He said, that's what's happening is because you can't have what you want. So now you throw in temper tantrums. Right. And that's really what it comes down to. We're grown people having temper tantrums mm -hmm. and have not come to that place of realizing that our relationships are meant to be extensions of our relationship with God. And God gave us the most perfect relationships in our spouse. Mm -hmm. The reason why he gave us a spouse was so that we could have a reflection of who he is yeah. on the earth. Somebody tangible that we could pour our love into. Somebody that we could show how much he means to us. And he did that so that we could become one. So people could see the oneness between him and his church. So that they could see that relationship and so that it would produce the love that he has in the earth with children. Yes. And so if those relationships are broken, people can't see what that's supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. So if we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing and we're walking in our flesh because we're selfish and we're not treating one another right. And we're not treating our children right. And so our children are running around acting crazy. They're like, what kind of God is that? We're treating each other wrong. It's like, what kind of God is that? And so he says, I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection. So, yeah, there may be times when you're not as happy with one another as you want to be, but you need to put your flesh into subjection and do what the word says. Amen. It may not be the way you want it to be, but put your flesh into subjection and do what the word says, Amen. because it's not about what you want. It's what does the word say? And he says, and when I have preached to others, I myself might be disqualified. I'm not going to spend my time trying to help you get your children on track, mm -hmm. trying to help you get your marriage on track. And then people walking around looking at me like I'm crazy because my house tore up. See, you've heard the saying before, the charity starts at home. Well, so does ministry. If your house ain't right, ain't no such thing as ministry. And so that's where the first place, see, people always want, well, I want to go out here and do, do, do evangelism. I want to go out here, you know, and witness the folk. I, I want to go out here and I want to preach. I want to go out and do this. You better take care of home. Get your house right. Because your house will preach by itself. Yeah. Folk will want to know your God just by, see, people don't understand. People were following Jesus because of the results he had in his life. See, everybody thinks they were following Jesus because he was turning water into wine and all that. They were following Jesus just because they saw his life was different. Mm -hmm. So if everybody around you is getting divorced, everybody around you is always arguing and fighting, and they sitting there looking at us, we've been married go 20 years in September and can't stop looking at each other, they want to know what you got. Amen. Yeah, that's what you call Jesus right there. Everybody else out here, they got to lock the doors at night to keep their kids in the house. And, and my kids look like they, they want to stay at home with us. Right. And they like, what you got? That's Jesus. And so that's what you have to do because that's what those intimate relationships were meant for. Amen. They were meant to be something that is a witness to the earth to bring glory unto God. Amen. And I was just thinking about your flesh. You know, it talks about even being like a boxer. You know, a boxer just doesn't smack it. A boxer pounds it in, doesn't it? And, you know, even when the flesh does rise, you know, and yes, Pastor and I have been married 20 years, but we almost 20 years, and we talk about intense moments of fellowship. You know, that's when I try to look past the flesh. And when I know my flesh isn't right, because it, it happens, I then treat my own flesh like I'm in the boxing ring. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I don't allow what my opinions are, my feelings um, take over what I know God has put together. Because we know marriage is a process. Marriage, marriage takes effort, not work. You hear folk all the time, oh, marriage is hard, marriage is work, that old ball and chain. Well, you can say what you want. It takes effort. Because honestly, if they say I got to work every day of the week, seven days of the week, I don't want to work. <laughs> I don't want to work. It's effort. And the same thing with our parenting. You know, we don't separate when it comes to instruction and disciplining our children. 
Because children know who to go to. Yeah, let me get mom. I know she's just got off work. She's vulnerable. Let me go ahead and see if I can ask her if I can have an extra snack, you know, or something. But they know how to go to the path of less resistance. The important thing, though, is that we're always together about, you know, how we parent our children, how we even support their dreams and their mission. Because when we're gone on away from here, gone and transition with the Lord, they're going to be left behind. They're carrying that Tucker DNA and that Swain and Morgan and all the family DNA. But the DNA doesn't necessarily have to define them. Their destiny in Christ does, though. And I want to be held accountable and know that I've done all I can as a mother, as a wife, to help support them to reach that destiny. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. 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 Well, give God praise. Amen. Well, we praise God for you today. Like I said, we, we just, we, we really want people to recognize how important your intimate relationships are because no matter what you think of your reputation, your character is what speaks for Christ. Because your reputation is who people think you are, but your character is who you really are. And it's those people who know you best that really know who you are. And so if we have issues with our character, we need to, we need to submit and allow God to develop our character. Because that's what's going to allow us to complete that assignment and to fulfill that assignment that he has for us to demonstrate his glory. Amen. Amen. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Precious God, Lord, we ask you today, Father, that you would just bless us today. Lord, if there is one today who does not know you in the pardon of our sins, that they would be able to receive you today, that they would just accept you in their heart. If there's one who desires Christ, who has never had him, has never been a part of his family, you can raise your hand today. We can lead you into the body of Christ. Secondly, if you're looking for a church home, a place that you could be united in Christ, a place that you could have pastors, teachers that would help grow you into becoming the, the mature believer that you need to be, you have a church family that will support you, to surround you, a family that you could belong to here in the earth, then you can come today. If all hearts are clear, I want to pray with our internet audience. If you've received Christ today, all you have to do is pray with me. Precious God, I thank you. Lord, I realize that I'm imperfect, that my life has never been perfect. And there's nothing I can do to perfect myself. I realize that Jesus died for my sins. And so I ask you now, Father, that you would come into my heart. I give up my life and I take the life of Christ. I realize that you raised him from the dead and he's now seated with you in heaven. That by doing so, Lord, that I become a part of your family. I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. Change my life forever. Make me a part of you. Empower me to live above sin. And give me all that you have entitled me to as a part of your family. If you prayed that prayer with us today, then you're now a part of the body of Christ. There's a link on the, uh, on, on the link here. And if, uh, if you need more information about finding a church home or more information about salvation, go out to our website, contact us, and let us know. We'd be glad to pray with you and help you find a church in your area. But we love you today and so glad that you joined us today. Praise God. Give God praise.